This next song is another one that has been requested by the Aussies. It's called uh, Case On by Cold Chisel. So I'm going to do that next, but before I do that, I do want to thank you for coming to my channel, for watching my videos, and for supporting my channel, and for the wonderful comments that you make. I really do appreciate it. And as I do with every artist that I feature on my channel, I will go to Cold Chisel's YouTube channel and get all their links and put them in the description field of my video. So if you'll click on the more link of the description, you'll be able to see all those links. What I ask you to do is to support the artists by subscribing to their YouTube channel, by following them on their social media accounts, and by buying their music if you like their music. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is Cold Chisel singing k -son. Yeah. 
Well, I don't have any idea what they sung about. <laughs> I didn't understand a word of that, so I'm going to have to look up the lyrics. See if we can make sense of it. Let's see here. Uh, I left my heart to the sappers round K Son. <clears throat> and my soul was sold with my cigarettes to the black market man. I've had the Vietnam cold turkey from the ocean to the silver city. And it's only other vets could understand. Well, I agree with that. The sappers he's talking about <clears throat> around Khe Sanh, where the uh, Vietnamese communists dug tunnels trying to get into the base. If, if you're not familiar with Khe Sanh, <clears throat> it was a huge uh, marine base in northern South Vietnam, close to the border of North Vietnam, and therefore a thorn in the side of the communists. And they attacked it uh, in 1968 with uh, several divisions. They were hoping that they could have another Dien Bien Phu like they had in 1954, I think it was. Was it 54? Yeah, I think it was 54 with the French, which was what drove the French out of Vietnam. But it didn't work out that way. They, the, uh, the U.S. brought in 50, B-52 bombers and just bombed the daylights out of them. God only knows how many men died in those trenches because they were flattened by the bombs. <clears throat> but there were a lot of uh, injured and killed in the Marines, too. Uh, let's see, verse 2 is about the long-forgotten dockside guarantees, how there were no V-Day heroes in 73, how we sailed into Sydney Harbor, saw an old friend that couldn't kiss her, but couldn't kiss her. She was lined... Okay, I don't know what that means. She was lined and I was home to the lucky land. Well, she was so many more than that time on. Their lives were all so empty till they found their chosen one and their legs were often open and their minds were always closed and their hearts were held in fast, fast suburban chains. Okay, I, I still don't know what this is about. And the legal pads were yellow, hours-long pay packets, golly days, pay packets lean, and the telex writers clattered when the gunships once had been, where the gunships once had been. But the car parks made me jumpy, and I never stopped the dreams, or the growing need for speed and Novocaine. Okay, so... <clears throat> I, I do get something out of this. Uh, I still, some of the verses I'm not really sure about. Maybe some of you Aussies can fill me in. Maybe this is Aussie slang that I'm not familiar with. But, um, you know, when he, when he talks about uh, car parks made him jumpy and he never stopped the dreams, that's not at all unusual for vets who've been in war. <clears throat> I've talked about this before, but the trauma that you feel, that you experience when you're in war, uh, depending on the circumstances, will never let you go. I met a woman on the internet who was suffering from PTSD from Iraq. She was a um, third-party contractor. She drove a, a semi, and they drove in convoys, and they drove with partners, so a driver and a co-driver. She was sitting in the passenger seat, and her, her driver was hit by an RPG. And, of course, when an RPG hits a human being, <coughs> they literally uh, just disintegrate. And, of course, all of him was blown all over her. And so when she came home, she could no longer drive a truck because she got so nervous driving at night that it, it just, she had to get off the highway. And uh, 
I, I talked to her about it and I tried to help her through it. I told her that there were certain things that were triggering these memories. Sight, the five senses, sight, smell, touch, taste, and seeing. Anything that triggers any one or more of those senses that reminds you of that time, like maybe the way that it smelled when you were in the truck before, before the RPG hit. Maybe the way, else, the way it smelled in the truck after the RPG hit. Maybe the sound of the RPG hitting. Maybe the sound of the engine. It can be anything, but those sounds, those sights, those touches, those tastes, those sights will trigger those memories. That's what PTSD is. It's the... It's the... Um, bringing up of the traumatic event, bring it back to your consciousness. And in some cases, it's so vivid that you actually think that you're in the middle of it when you're not. So what I told her she needed to do was she needed to tell her, her employer that one, she couldn't drive white trucks because that was what she was driving in Vietnam, in uh, uh, Iraq. She needed to drive a Peterbilt or a Kenworth, anything but a white, because the dashboard will remind her of the truck she was in. Two, she couldn't drive at night because that's when they drove all their convoys, so driving at night would trigger the memories. And I said, three, <clears throat> music is really powerful. So pick some songs that you really love that you were not listening to when you were in Iraq and play those while you're driving. And what will happen is your mind will associate the sound of the truck and the, the motion and everything else with that pleasant feeling that you get when you're listening to that song. And it will help replace those traumatic events. They'll never go away completely, but you can, you can lessen the impact of them by replacing the memory of driving in a truck with good memories from later driving in a truck. Uh, I never heard back from her, so I don't know if it helped at all, but um, that's, that's what PTSD is. It's, it's, it's the um, mental recreation of a very traumatic event triggered by one or more of your senses. And there, there's no way that you can stop that from happening. You can lessen the impact by doing things. And you can replace the memories with positive memories. But you can never get rid of the trauma. I mean, it's always going to be there. It, you, you can just get it to subside so it's not so powerful. And so you don't have the episodes where you literally are back in the fight. So, uh, <clears throat> there was something else he said in there. Let me go back to this, to this lyrics, because I want to talk about it. Um, I left my heart to the sappers round the so case on, and my soul was sold with my cigarettes to the black market man. This is all right out of Vietnam. There was a, a huge black market going on. Probably is in every war. <clears throat> I had the Vietnam cold turkey from the ocean to the Silver City. I think what he's talking about there is um, it was such a strange war because for the first time, you know, in World War II in, in Korea, troops were taken to the battlefront on ships. And so they had days, if not weeks, to think about what they were headed towards and to uh, deal with their fears and deal with their anticipation and all those sorts of things. And by the time they got to where they were being sent, they had kind of adapted to being amongst a lot of other military men, nobody else around except other guys, and... They kind of adapted to the idea that they were going into combat. But in Vietnam, they got flown in. So 
you jumped on an airplane and, and you know 16 hours later you were in the jungle it was like like he said cold turkey it's instantaneous you go from uh normalcy to hell on earth to chaos and confusion and blood and guts and it's the people that served in Vietnam the Aussies and the Americans and there were others the South Koreans were there um, the British had a small contingent there <clears throat> they were they were basically taken from quote quote normal life and inserted into the jungle in what in terms of time and lifetime is just an instant and bam they were in it and then they were in it for 12 months and you know you could die any day you could get injured any day you could see your buddy die any day. You never knew what was going, what was around the next corner. You never knew when the next bullet was going to catch you. And then at the end of your tour, you jump on an airplane, and you know half a day later, you're, you're back in normalcy. But for you, it wasn't normal anymore. What was normal was walking through the jungle and being shot at. And you can imagine the mental stress that that puts someone under to try and adapt to that sudden change of circumstances and then when you top when you put on top of that the way that they were treated when they came home it was it was too much for some of them it was too much they couldn't handle it for many others like me and again i never served in combat in vietnam but I was affected by the attitude of the public just as much as the guys who were in combat. For me, I just, uh, I withdrew. I crawled inside my shell and for decades, I didn't talk about my service. I was actually ashamed that I'd served in the military. That's how powerful the effect was of what people were doing to the Vietnam vets was on someone who was never in Vietnam. And it wasn't until um, the early 2000s that I got involved with a group uh, that was standing up for the Vietnam vets. And I met a guy who was a sergeant who served in Iraq and I shared with him my story and he told me I had nothing to be ashamed of and <laughs> believe it or not I, I argued with him I actually argued with him but he wouldn't take no for an answer I mean he was a tough guy and and he he just kept telling me he says you should be proud of your service no matter what your service was you should be proud of it and I finally realized he was right. And every person who served in any war, regardless of what the war was, should be proud of their service. They should be proud of what they did because they went to war, willingly or unwillingly, when their, when their government asked them to, and they fought and they didn't run away. They weren't cowards. And... It, the governments are the ones that make these decisions about wars. It's not, not the 19-year-olds. It's not the kids, trust me. The kids just volunteer because they believe in the mission and they believe in each other and they think it's the right thing to do. And most of the Vietnam vets I know still think that the war, Vietnam War was the right thing to do. They don't believe all this junk you hear about how it was an illegal, immoral war and how... Uh, we never should have been there. That's just baloney. We were fighting communists, evil communists, who murdered and slaughtered innocent South Vietnamese <laughs> civilians. <coughs> Excuse me. As a matter of policy. 
Everybody on the God's green earth is well aware of the My Lai Massacre. Everybody knows about it. There's 21 books about the My Lai Massacre, and it's talked about repeatedly. It was brought up during the Iraq War, trying to compare something that happened in Iraq to My Lai. And I can tell you from my standpoint and from the standpoint of all the vets that I know, every single one to a man is completely disgusted by that massacre. It was the wrong thing to do. It was evil, and they should have been tried and convicted of murder. The fact that they weren't is the fault of the government, not the individuals. But nobody talks about the Way Massacre. And I've researched that in detail. I've written a, a comprehensive uh, report on the Way Massacre. And as a matter of fact, you can just go to Wikipedia and look up Way Massacre. That is my article, and you can read it. Read what the communists did in North Vietnam and South Vietnam. They slaughtered people. They shot them in the head. They buried them alive. They killed in Way, just in this one massacre, they killed over 5,000 people. 5,000. We don't know how many died at My Lai. I hear different numbers from 250 up to 500. So let's take the 500. Let's say that it was 500. It's horrible if it's 20. But 500 is horrible. It is. But 5,000 is 10 times worse. And the difference between My Lai and the Way Massacre is that in My Lai, they were killing people because they had gone, they'd lost discipline. You know, they, they, they were taking out their anger on their quote, quote, enemy. They were murdering because they had seen so many of their own buddies. And I'm not making excuses for them. There is no excuse for it. But they were doing that as a reaction to what had been done to them. And their leadership told them that there were no civilians in My Lai. They lied. They plain out lied. But that's what they told them, and so they believed them, and so they started killing people. But in way, in the Way Massacre, they had well thought out, planned in advance murders that they conducted from lists that they had created of people that they wanted to kill. That's the difference. Good men will commit evil deeds under stress. Evil men will commit evil deeds with no stress at all. That's the difference between the Way Massacre and the My Lai Massacre. And... If you have to live with that, well, I don't know how you live with that. I mean, there is no way that you can justify that in your mind. You just have to lie to yourself. That's the only way I know of that you could do that, is you lie to yourself. You tell yourself it was justified when you know dang well it wasn't. But I don't know what the North Vietnamese tell themselves because they planned it that way. Sorry, I'm getting way off the track, but uh, this song was, you know, it was a rock and roll song and it had a decent melody to it, but boy, I couldn't understand. I mean, I picked up like one out of every 10 words that that guy was singing. So I hope some of you got more of it. I know that some of you asked for this song and so you probably enjoyed it. And I did it for you, for, for my Aussie followers, because I know... Today is a special day for you. And I also pray for you. I pray that you will have an abundant life, that you'll live a long time, that you'll be healthy, and that God will keep you safe from harm. I pray you never have to go to war again. And I pray that God will do that same thing for every person that you love, because I know those people are special to you. And I also pray that you will be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, you will make your requests known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Mirror Vet, out.